Hey everyone, DJ Short from Rotoworld here, joined by Eric Samolski, uh, and we're back for our weekly Q&A. Uh, I was off last week and, and Chris Crawford filled in. Uh, you'll see more of Chris Crawford throughout the season, uh, both with our chats and the podcast, uh, but we're back together here today. So we'll be here for the next, like, what, like 40 minutes or so, answering uh, your fantasy baseball questions. It's cool we have some actual afternoon baseball going on right yeah. now, early afternoon. We'll, we'll make sure we're done before that starts. So <laughs> we, can go, we can go watch it, but yeah. Uh, and it's it actually feels like spring outside in New York, too, which mm -hmm. is cool. Oh, like, yeah. Feeling serious, like baseball vibes right now, which is which is good. Um, it was also nice to see the Mets. I'm a Mets fan, you know that, but yes. they were very plucky last night. And it was so weird because usually the Mets get their brains beaten in in Atlanta, but they actually came back from four runs down to win a game in Atlanta, which just feels like sometimes you're like life is a simulation and it feels like maybe something's <laughs> off right now with the simulation, but I will take it. It does feel like Atlanta's maybe reeling a little bit yeah um not the worst time to get atlanta in a series um yeah. but yeah we're uh, we've got some interesting um get some interesting games itching action right now mets looks great um you know i am a red sox fan the red sox have looked pretty good obviously got some disappointing news today yeah. which i'm sure we'll talk about um but yeah it's been it's you know pirates looking good like it's been a fun little start to the baseball season yeah, with Paul Skeens, you know, waiting in the minors to be called up at, at some point. And, you know, if the Pirates keep playing well, I feel like there's going to be more and more pressure maybe yeah. to bring them up if they're actually competing. So it uh, should be fun to watch. Uh, a lot of, like you said, a lot of bad news with pitchers recently, Nick Pavetta being the latest. But, you know, over the weekend, Shane Bieber, Spencer Strider, mm -hmm. Yuri Perez facing Javi John surgery. Fr Framber well. Valdez scratched with Framber an elbow. Yeah. yeah. So it just I keeps going and going. I would encourage everybody, uh, Scott Pianowski and I started off the Roto World Baseball show yesterday talking about this, um, so if you haven't listened to that episode of the podcast yet, you can get it anywhere. You get podcasts. Um, we do cover also like some waiver wire discussions, so there is some fantasy goodness in there, but also just talking about you know, what is the future both of baseball and fantasy baseball in terms of these you know arm injuries. So again, that's the, the Roto World Baseball show. Get it wherever um, and uh, check out that the beginning of that episode and you'll be doing another episode tomorrow so twice a week road oil baseball show definitely check it out so we're going to start answering some questions now and uh you know feel free anything that's on your mind whether it's waiver wire pickups trades um just overall opinions on maybe some minor leagues to stash you know we're happy to answer it so first question here from frank and he pulled off a trade he needed some stolen bases so he traded Brandon Drury and Tanner Hawk for uh, Andres Jimenez. Um, his starting pitcher is still pretty solid staff here. Castillo, Kirby, Gosman, Gilbert, Bryce Miller, uh, Sanchez with Senga on the IL. What do you think draw, uh, trading from his strength uh, to get some stolen bases? Yeah. I, I mean, you look at the rest of that staff, you can't really fault. Uh, it clearly, I'm going to guess he's a Mariners fan. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, basically the yeah. entire. I wonder if he has. I guess he doesn't have Wu stashed on the IL. Um, yeah. But yeah, th there's no. He could definitely have gotten rid of Hauk um, as a quality start league as well. Um, I don't know when Hauk starts facing better competition how much he's going to go six innings. Yeah. Um, and I and I like Jimenez, um, and I think that lineup is you know feisty and they're playing pretty well. Um, and so I think that's a, a solid deal overall yeah same same here uh i know jimenez may, maybe you know two years ago is like the peak fantasy wise for jimenez like we'll, we'll see he's still very young but the speed is something at least gives him a safer floor so mm -hmm. uh everyone talking about heston kerstad uh jada with the question eta for for uh heston kerstad um i don't know i i feel like maybe it's gonna require either someone on the major league level playing poorly or an injury of some sort in the short term. I, right. I, I like him long term, but I'm just not sure that there's an opening right now, even with him being an RBI machine in AAA. Yeah, every I, I have been – we've been answering a lot of questions about uh, Kirstead both here and then, you know, when I do my Sunday waiver wire column, 
Um, as I've kind of been mentioning, my stance is like Colton Kowser played better than Kirstad in the spring. Mm-hmm. Colton Kowser won a spot on the major league roster. Colton Kowser is 24 years old and was a top 30 prospect and was the fifth overall pick in his draft. It's not like he's a some afterthought. Like he is a legitimate prospect in his own right. He's yeah. on the major league roster. He's starting today over Austin Hayes. I think the Orioles are going to give him a shot before they decide to go to the minor leagues. So, so yeah. I think Kirstad's timeline depends probably on what happens over the next couple of weeks with Kowser. If we start to see Kowser get more opportunities like today and start to play, then Austin Hayes is a fine fourth outfielder and there's really no need to bring up Heston Kirstad. Um, If Kowser struggles and they want to, you know, give another young guy a shot, then I think, you know, maybe that's a timeline for Kirstad. So uh, I, I personally couldn't see it happening barring injury in like the next two, three weeks, but I I know people want to stash him. Yeah, and that's a good re- lead into our next question here from Dave. How how do you know when to stash Jackson Holiday not included? And I've kind of had this philosophy for a long time. And and I think Paul Skeens is in a category by himself. But the way I generally look at uh, prospect pitchers, I don't stash them at all. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I think I'm more likely to stash a major league pitcher who's on the IL like a Nick Lodolo, something like that. I would rather do that then stash a prospect pitcher, especially with all the injuries across Major League Baseball right now. So I'm stashing hitters. And I think it's a little bit different now with teams being incentivized to, you know, bring their prospects up sooner. I think you want to be a little more aggressive earlier in the year with position players who have a more clear path. And we just talked about Kierstad. It's not necessarily as clear, but there might be other situations where it is more clear. Yeah, I, I always look at three things. The production of the prospect you want to stash, I think obviously is the most obvious, right? Not just in their name, but like, are they playing really well? The op- the playing time opportunity, right? Is there a person legitimately struggling at the position at the major league level? Not like, oh, well, he's clearly better than this guy. Okay, but, but is that guy not playing well? Is he not contributing to the team, look at defensive stats in there as well. Like, look at overall, you know, war wins above replacement. Like, if a guy might not be hitting, but he's playing elite defense, the team will look at that as being like he is a contributing player. Right. Um, and then you need to look at the state of your overall roster. If I want to stash this guy and it might take three weeks, can I do that? Um, do I have the, do I have the, the, you know, stability in the rest of my roster that like I can use this spot on a stash because once everybody in the league sees that you've made that waiver claim you've essentially started the clock on that prospect right mm-hmm. even if people know who he is like you're sneaking him by anybody now somebody else is thinking oh okay now we're we're stashing these guys so if you then don't have the ability to keep that guy on your roster for a, for two weeks and you have to drop him now somebody else is like, oh, okay, if I don't pick him up now, I'm going to lose him, and then somebody else could pick up that prospect. So th- that's the third component that I think is really important. I don't see like a ton of position prospects out there at the moment that that fit that category necessarily. Right. Um, Kyle Manzardo is someone I think we'll see um, probably sooner rather than later. Uh, James Wood, who had an awesome spring training with the Nationals, like – I don't sense that the Nationals have any sense of of urgency to bring him up. They're not competing this year. So while he had a great spring, he's off to a good start. Like, I don't think the situation's right. So it's hard for me to to recommend a lot of these guys that are in the minors right now. Yeah, I don't think it's anybody that is... Non-Orioles category or Polsky. Right, (laughs) non-Orioles category. Even like, you know, Junior Caminero. Where where is he going to play? I mean, they've yeah. clearly he's, he's hurt right now too a little. Right, he is, he's serious, got that, that quad injury, but it's like they've shown that they don't necessarily want him being. He's not going to play shortstop. Yeah. So it's going to take an injury to Paredes at third base, or I guess you call him up to be the DH, um, which again is is feasible. It's whether the the Rays want to do that or not. So he's going to have to get back and healthy, and he's going to get back on the field, and he's going to produce, and then maybe. You know, the Rays who are not off to a great start 
might want to jumpstart their lineup a little bit and use Caminero as a DH. So that that's the other option right. I could see. You know, but yeah. to your point, like it, there's got to be, you know, the Nationals went into the season with Lane Thomas and you know uh, Eddie Rosario and Jesse Winker, like. They're not just going to give up on those veterans after three weeks. Like they knew right. what they were doing. Those guys are going to get a couple of months before they're going to go to James Wood. And, right. you know, I think yeah. ideally what the Nationals are hoping for is for Rosario to have a nice season and they can trade him for, you know, a fringy prospect at the deadline. Like right. that's, I, they want to hit on one of those guys, like a Joey Gallo. Same, same thing. Maybe, you know, there's some lightning in the bottle there. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what they're aiming for as a rebuilding team. I think we'll see Wood this year at some point, yeah. but I think it'll be later in the summer. I could be surprised, but that's that's where I uh, fall on it. Yeah, so, I know. I know people were also into like Chase DeLauder, and I thought it was interesting yeah. that the India, the Guardians, sorry, decided to send him to Double A again. He only played six games there last year, but like rather uh, than say, "Oh, you crushed," you know spring training and we'll get you a triple a so yeah. i think it might be a little while for him um a prospect who's like not super high on people's radars is um zach deloach with the yeah. white Sox, and that's an opportunity where like listen this guy hit 286 with 23 homers for the mariners in triple a last year the that opportunity is there off the that lineup is terrible <clears throat> but he's hitting he's hitting 240 with a 28 percent strikeout rate in triple a right now so the white Sox may be like why? Why would we do? Why would we call them up? So yeah. yeah. Well, I thought the White Sox were the worst team in baseball coming into the year, and that was even expecting you know Oloy Jimenez and uh, Luis Robert to be in the lineup, and now they're both hurt. So it is that is a rough lineup, but mm -hmm. someone that you should be streaming against every opportunity you get. Um, up next, a philosophical question: With the rash of arm injuries, including now Pavetta and Sawyer Gibson Long. Um, do you think teams will be aggressive with tops uh, starting pitcher promotions last year, like last year or slow down? I, I do think this is a philosophical question because if you are a team and this is kind of like big picture, even looking outside fantasy, but there's a couple of ways to look at it. I tweeted something over the weekend. Like when this starts to impact the team's bottom line is maybe when the conversation will change. However, if you are a, a small budget team, why wouldn't you just run those talented young arms mm -hmm. into the ground while they're cheap, you know, um, as opposed to preserving them for the long haul, which is maybe what you're thinking about when a pitcher gets to like arbitration and, and you sign them to a, a huge contract if they make it that far. But I think we're in a weird position now where if you're a, I don't think the, the behavior of these small market teams is incentivized to change because I think they want to get the maximum value out of them when they're cheap. Right. Um, I'll extrapolate this out from a conversation I had with one of my college teammates who works in an MLB organization and just assume that the logic that they possess is similar to what a lot of other MLB organizations will think. Um, I don't think this will meaningfully change what was already happening, which is teams being a little more aggressive. We saw that last year. And so I think... This won't make teams even more aggressive than that, but you'll see, you know, guys like the Pirates. I don't know that they would have called up Jared Jones three years ago, right? Yeah. He was 22 years old. They didn't need to. They had veteran arms. They could have, you know, put in there. They didn't need to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Teams are spending a lot of money on trying to create data on the biometrics of the pitchers that they draft in order to figure out what are the health risks of this particular pitcher and what can I do to prevent that. Right. So I think that teams are actively assuming that they're drafting pitchers who are used, who are injury risks, and they're going to try to fix those injury risks. So to them, it wouldn't be, hey, I'm going to rush you to the majors because your arm may fall off. It might be, hey, I'm going to make sure that I start working my plan to fix the health red flags that you popped in the draft process so we can get you to be less of a risk when you're pitching for us. Um, my buddy was also very blunt and he was like, we don't, we're not really worried about elbow injuries. Hmm. Like data has shown that pitchers will bounce back from elbow injuries. He's like, we care about shoulder injuries and back injuries. 
He was like, if right. pitchers have shoulder injuries and back injuries, we're way more concerned. We yeah. will we will rehab a guy's elbow and assume that he'll be back to throwing the way that he used to throw. Sometimes um, stronger. And sometimes stronger. So I, I so I think the elbow stuff might not change too much how teams are are treating their younger pitchers. Yeah. I mean, we have Tommy John surgery, but you know, shoulder issues are a death knell. Um that's always a variable uh, situation when a when a pitcher comes back from a, a shoulder surgery for sure, especially like that shoulder capsule uh, surgery. Um, not many success stories uh, with that. So, I, I yeah, I, I I don't know, but fantasy wise, you know, even tackling this season as as we go beyond here, like how. If you are in a situation where earlier someone was dealing from a strength with starting pitching, like, mm -hmm. are you a little more careful now when you're thinking about dealing a starting pitcher to get a position player? Or are you just like, well, it's pitching, it's risky? Yeah, I mean, listen, my draft strategy was to really load up on starting pitching, uh, in particular late round starting pitching, because I was taking those upside flyers and thinking I'll drop the guys that don't work and I'll... Um, you know, pick up the bats that are really emerging. And I yeah. haven't really dropped those pitchers yet. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is because, honestly, like not a lot of bats have jumped out to me have been like, oh, I have to get this guy on waivers. Like I understand, you know, we've talked about guys like Bryce Terang and Michael Conforto and, you know, yeah. Oliver Dunn and, you know, My Michael A. Taylor, whatever. These guys have all come up. Depending on your league type, in a lot of like non-15-team leagues, um, I do believe in Conforto's swing change. I, I have tried to yeah. add him in places. But a lot of those other guys aren't like, a, oh, my God, if I miss out on this guy, I'm going to regret it. So I've looked at guys like D.L. Hall who are on my bench, and I thought, eh, I might just keep him on my bench for one more start because yeah. the rest of, you know, uh, my the rest of my numbers are dwindling, and I'm looking on the wire and thinking, I don't know that there's as much available in terms of starting pitching that would – would be clearly better than a guy like D.L. Hall or a guy like, you know, Jack Flaherty, who had a really rough start the last time out against the A's. But, like, there's enough happening that's intriguing that, like, unless I really need that spot, I'd rather keep him on my bench and just yeah. see how it plays out. So a good question here. Uh, are you buying Anthony Volpe's early numbers? To me, I, I kind of am. Like, I mean... Yeah, he's not going to hit 400 all season. Uh, his batting average on balls in play is 520. Like those things are not going to last. But what I'm looking at is the strikeout rate. It's it's down six percent so far. Yes, it's a small sample, but um, these plate discipline type numbers tend to be stickier and um, you know normalize pretty pretty quickly and can mm -hmm. be signs of a of a breakout. Uh, so the strikeout rate's lower, but also the chase rate is lower which you you love to see as well um he had a, a rough season a rough rookie season but fantasy wise he still was helpful um so i don't think it's unexpected that he would take a step forward as he gets a little bit more experience so yeah i don't think he's gonna hit you know, 400 or probably not hit 300 but yes. uh, i do think we're seeing a player who's taking a healthy step forward I just had this conversation with uh, some Yankee fan friends of mine where they were like, oh, he's going to – he'll end the year. He's going to hit 300, 20 home runs, 40 stolen bases. And I was like, I I'll take the under um, hmm. on the batting average part at least. I I'm buying – I am buying the changes. I was buying the swing change in the spring, and I thought, you know what? Like this is a guy who could hit 250 or 260 this year. Not, not yeah. for good, but this year. Like he could make that kind of jump, which is a huge jump from what he was doing – last year right yeah and so i look at what he's hitting now like well over 400 and i'm not i don't really think that that changes what i'm thinking i think the swing change is real the contact growth is real the plate discipline growth is real and he could hit 260 maybe 270 this year and that would be an incredible improvement from his rookie year and that doesn't mean that's where he'll settle as a hitter he could eventually become a 300 hitter but i just think we we need to pump the brakes a little bit on asking a guy who hit 209 in his first season to raise his batting average 100 points, which is a pretty shocking – would be a pretty shocking improvement. But I think if you have shares of Anthony Vol Volpe, you are feeling great. 
And if somebody in your league wants to sell high because they think that this isn't his level, um, sure. I would be interested in buying high if you know Thanks. the asking price is still something reasonable. Yeah. Uh, up next, uh, sort of the other side of the coin here, where the two you know hyped rookies a year ago, position players, uh, were Anthony Volpe and Jordan Walker. Um, Walker still not finding that success, at least so far. Uh, so Ryan with the question, is it too soon to dump Jordan Walker? Second year in a row, he's not showing any signs he belongs in the bigs. He was pretty good down the stretch last year. Um, yeah. But so far this season, pretty discouraging, uh, yeah. to be I, honest. Uh, the strikeout rate is up. Uh, I'm just on fan graphs, but, you know, so take it for what it's worth. But the line drive rate for him is 4.3%, and he's hitting the ball on the ground uh, almost 60% of the time. Like, all of those things are bad. Mm-hmm. Um, I would probably be patient, but all of those things are bad. Yeah, I, I would pump the brakes on second year in a row that he's not showing any signs he belongs in the bigs. I mean, as a rookie last year, he hit 276 with, with 16 home runs and just a 22% strikeout rate. Like, you know, that's that's not bad. Um, yeah. He is not making meaningful contact this year. The ground ball rate is up. Um, the walk rate is up. Um, the chase rate is down. He's swinging out of the zone way less he's making the same amount of contact his swinging strike rate is the same as last year so he's probably working deeper counts is what's happening so he is he is swinging earlier in the count less he is getting to two strike counts way more often um but again his two strike o swing so his two strike swinging chase rate basically is down 10 percent so a lot of these things are telling me like this is a guy, a, a young player who's a, trying to adjust his approach at the plate. He's walking more. He's chasing out of the zone less, but he's also possibly getting himself into more pitchers counts, mm-hmm. which are causing him to swing at pitches that are not pitches he could drive, which are cause which is causing you know um, more ground balls. So like okay. you and I chatted a little bit of like you know oh should we do some sort of like panic or don't panic like right. content. And if Jordan Walker was on there, I would say, I would say, don't panic. Like I would put this at a yellow flag and not a red flag. Like there are some things that obviously don't look great, but I see a young kid working through the process of his approach at the plate. And I would give him a little more time also because Victor Scott has not looked great early on. And so when Lars Newbar comes back, I don't believe that Jordan Walker is in any danger. Sure. Now, if Jordan Walker continues to hit like this by the time Tommy Edmond comes back, then, you know, you might be looking at him being sent back down to work on some things. But that's weeks away. Yeah, I uh, agree. Uh, up next, Delaware Fishing with a question. Got offered Bryce Harper and Snell for Trout. I would take that like every day of the week. I'm assuming you feel the same. If if I'm I want the Bryce Harper side. I always I never know how people when they word this like what yeah. they're getting. Oh, that's I, I would point. take I would take the Bryce Harper side. Yes. Um I, I still think Harper is the best player in that deal and you're getting Snell. Um I when it was I first read it and thought it was Harper for Snell and Trout, and that was like a little bit closer to me. Oh, but okay. I was still yeah. probably gonna tell you to take Harper. So now I'm definitely telling you to take Harper. Yeah. I agree. Um, and I wouldn't take much away from like Snell's early starts. Um, I think it's going to be a little while before, you know, we see him up to full strength. Uh, mm-hmm. I, and that, I think that's a factor with these guys who signed late. Like you got to give them a little bit of time because they didn't have a normal routine their normal spring training. Um, JD Martinez with the Mets, he played a, a, one or two triple A games and then had like, general soreness which is one of my favorite baseball terms uh (laughs) so he and he's 36 so he you know needed a couple days to to rest a little bit yeah we all we all do it happens i feel it i feel it um so you know i I wouldn't look too much into that but no i i i like the deal and i would i would take that assuming it's as we think it was worded (laughs) uh another philosophical question uh for the same reasons as before are we at the point with the injuries where we need to move the bar for lines that make a starting pitcher a hold versus a stream. I mean, sort of, right? I mean, if, if there's fewer aces available, which is 
how it feels right now. I, I do think the bar changes a bit for what we think is a tolerable starting pitcher. Mm-hmm. But I also think that maybe you're a little more inclined to take that, you know, bulk reliever who may pitch two yeah. innings who could outproduce a streaming starting pitcher that you feel iffy about. Yeah, I, I think that that's another way to look at it too is like considering offense was up last year, I don't know that we want to lower our barometer for what is a starting pitcher or what is a streamer because you're just basically saying, well, I know this guy isn't going to pitch well for me, but there's not a lot better out there, so I'm going to put him on my roster. Whereas like, I'd rather say, you know what? I'm going to pick up Ryan Yarbrough, and he's going to pitch three to four innings for the Dodgers, and maybe he gives up one run, and I get a sneaky win. Um, And I would much rather take that than you know, really mine the depths of like, you know, what starter can I use? Like, yeah, I picked up Martin Perez in some places because he was facing the Pirates and I thought, okay, maybe he'll be useful. But like, if my best option was Martin Perez and he's facing like the Reds in Cincinnati, like I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that just because he's the best option. And so he should be considered like, I'd rather just take a, a middle reliever and Martin Perez off to a good start against the Tigers. Right. Um, Kind of in a similar vein here, Spencer Turnbull um, threw a no-hitter a couple of years back. Um, he did. But two solid outings in a row, resurgent here with the with the Phillies. Reds, Cardinals, have the Phillies tapped into hidden potential? Is he worth a pickup in Roto Leagues? I haven't had a chance to look at you know, his velocity and if he's changed his pitch mix. I'm wondering to get your opinion on him. Well, you can read it tomorrow morning. Okay. On NBC Sports, uh, in the in the new uh, edition of Mixing It Up, where I look at uh, pitchers' pitch mix pitch mix changes uh, and whether or not we should care. I will tell you, um, we should care about Spencer Turnbull. Um, he has a sweeper this year, and he has changed his curveball. I do think it is meaningfully impactful. I don't believe that he's necessarily a guy that you'll add to your roster and never put back on the waiver wire. Um, but I think it does. It is helpful, and he gets the Pirates and then the White Sox his next two starts. Um, so that in and of itself, even though the Pirates look good, but you know, anytime you're going to get somebody who's even decent who's pitching against the White Sox right now, um, you got to take that opportunity. Yep. Um, so this is a question that's maybe close to your heart. Of course, we heard about Trevor's story with the shoulder, and there's some worry about his bone structure, which like I don't think you ever want to hear. Uh, for a baseball player. Um, so what kind of rest of season outlook would you give Vaughn Grissom with likely zero risk to his playing time as a result? Um, I wonder, can Vaughn Grissom actually play shortstop? You know? They said they said no. Yep. Um, they said, well, they said he would get reps, but Craig Breslow just, they just did the press conference like 30 minutes ago, actually maybe not even, Um where they gave an update on Trevor Story and Nick Pavetta, and I can share that in a second. But he basically said they're sticking, they believe Von Grissom's future is at second base. They're going to stick with him at second base. He will get some reps at shortstop because it's always good to have middle infielders who can feel comfortable at both. Um, yeah. But he's going to get the majority of the reps um, at uh, second base, and shortstop is going to be. Um, mainly David Hamilton, and I believe he actually said uh, Romy Gonzalez, who they just called up um, from AAA, and that second base would be Grissom and Pablo Reyes. I think Pablo Reyes will probably get some reps at shortstop. They said Sedan Rafaela would would get some reps in there. Um, In the answer to the question is like, to me, it doesn't meaningfully change my outlook for Grissom because I felt like he was going to be the everyday second baseman when he came back from injury, and now I think he's going to be the everyday second baseman when he comes back from injury. I guess he has one less hitter who's potentially better than him and higher than him in the order. Yeah. Um, so if you like, you look at the Red Sox lineup right now, and like, and Manuel Valdez is hitting seventh today. So maybe Von Grissom hits seventh behind, you know, Rafaela and um, Casas and Yoshida and those guys. And so there's some RBI opportunities. But this is a guy I think is going to hit for a strong batting average and not too much power and not too much speed, but good counting stats. And he'll chip in a little bit everywhere. And, um, you know, they they have not moved off of mid to late April for him. I think he's probably yeah. going to start a rehab assignment soon. And so this is one of those guys where, like, you're talking about when is the right time to stash? Like, 
I would maybe be stashing Vaughn Grissom now if he's in your league because I think within two weeks, he's an everyday player for the Red Sox. Um, and in most formats, he's going to be shortstop eligible because that's all he played with the Braves. And so he will be second base shortstop. And, you know, that's useful having two positions you can move him around at. So you would stash, I mean, I agree with you, stash Grissom over Heston Kierstad, over Kobe Mayo. Jackson Holly's probably already sitting on someone's bench and understandably so. Um, we had another person ask, when do we see Jackson Holiday? Here we go. Um, is it really a situation where it could be any day now? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think, think so. It, yeah. I think so. Scott and I talked about this. Uh, so uh, to answer the first part, like depending on your team needs, I would be stashing Grissom over Kobe Mayo and Kirstad because I think we know he's going to be up soon. Exactly. Now, if you're in a shallower format, and like you don't need a middle infielder who's going to give you, you know, a solid batting average, but not hit a lot of home runs and not hit a lot of steals. Like you don't need to stash Grissom, right? Um, but you know, Scott and I talked about this on Monday, Jackson Holiday, and I don't think he was sent down for service time manipulation. You know, he struck out 31% of the time in spring training as a 20 year old. That's not alarming. But it's also like there's no reason not to send him to AAA, which is a, le a level he barely played at last year, and just let him hit the ground running, let him work on that contact issue a little bit, um, let him get you know get the season off started off with confidence. Ramon Urias has not been playing well. I know Jordan Westberg hit a game winning home run early in the season, but he's been fairly average. So I, I do believe there is a path. The downside right now is like. It just the Orioles need to be okay cutting Ramon Urias or Tony Kemp because they don't have options. So they need right. to be just flat out released. Um, and the Orioles basically need to decide if they think those guys are useful players to them, even on a bench or not. But but I said to Scott, I my guess is we were to see Jackson Holiday before May, is my thought. I agree. Uh, it's certainly a good sign that Holiday has more walks than strikeouts right now. Mm -hmm. Um, the strikeout rate, very reasonable. Um, off to a very good start. Man, the Orioles are just loaded. They're so good. It's so fun. They're so uh, good. So uh, we'll have time for a couple more here. MV with the question. Someone in my league <sighs> dropped Lane Thomas like two days ago. Drop James Outman or Lars Newtbar for Lane Thomas. Uh, the, I this probably is tough. would drop one of them. For this. I I I kind of think I would. Oh, I kind of think I would drop James Outman, um, and it's tough because I I really do like him, um, and I think that he could certainly write the ship and figure it out. He's playing often um, for the Dodgers, but I mean he's striking out thirty six percent of the time right now. Um, again, you know we're still early, but the chase rate has gone up. Um, he is swinging way more than he swung in the past. The swing strike rate is up just like a little bit, not a lot. Um, but like the zone contact is it, it's all just, he's swinging more out of the zone. He's making a little bit more contact, but he's also striking out. He's not hitting the ball hard. Like I'm not overly worried about James Outman, but I think if you have the chance to get Lane Thomas, I could, I could see doing it. So kind of in a similar vein here uh curious any buy low players you would suggest to trade for um i mean i think there's plenty out there i think it's just a matter of like is any manager in your league fundamentally changing right. their opinion on a player they drafted just like two weeks ago i think it's hard to find that match this early in the season unless uh, that owner uh, or manager has been impacted by some of these early pitching injuries. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree. Like in a vacuum, these buy low things are are difficult. I don't think like, yeah, I mean, Francisco Lindor is hitting 075. But like, I don't know that you're going to buy low on him because I don't really know that a, a, a whoever has him in your fantasy league is like, oh, Lindor isn't any good. Um, right. Some fringy guys that I would that I would be interested in adding but again, I, I'm not like giving up a lot to get. Um, um, his strikeout rate is high, but we that's not who he is. We know that. He's going to play every day against right-handers as a leadoff for the Twins. 
Um, and so I'm interested in in buying on him. Vinny Pasquantino is hitting 121, but still has just a 13% strikeout rate and an 11% walk rate. Like he's still making good swing decisions. Um, I think he'll get it going a little bit. Um, Christian Encarnacion Strand is somebody who like maybe I would have said in the past, like, oh, he's off to a slow start and the Reds infield is loaded with talent. And so he's going to get sent down to triple A. But I think he's got a little bit more runway right now. Um, with all these injuries but you know that like 31 percent strikeout rate with no walks is is not great um so i would certainly like to see that turn around um and yeah uh nico horner is somebody that scott and i talked about like Mm -hmm. there's some panic on nico horner because he's hitting 156 he has no stolen bases and he's hitting lower in the cubs order um but he's still making a lot of contact he's drawing a lot of walks I don't know why he wouldn't eventually start stealing the bases we expect him to steal. Like hitting lower in the order is actually better for steals, not in terms of like how many you get. Like he's going to get on, he's going to get fewer batting, uh, fewer plate appearances, but he's not hitting in front of with Cody Bellinger on. So they may run him with the eight or nine hitters up to get him into scoring position. So that's another guy I would, I would look to buy low on. Um, yeah, I think like a player that might be fringy in kind of a shallower league, especially if you're getting nothing from him right now, like a Tyro Estrada. I could feel I could see someone dropping him just because he's yeah. been such a he's been off to a slow start this year. Uh he was affected by injury last year, so the overall numbers didn't look as impressive. He's someone I could see trying to trying to pry away. Wyatt Langford had all the hype during spring training, and he's hasn't really done anything amazing so far evan carter is kind of the same way um i, I was just looking at evan carter it's like a 23 a percent walk rate and a seven percent strikeout rate um for a guy playing every day in a good lineup like we know he's talented yeah. um that's a guy where i i could see i could see trying to buy there because i you know again he's a was a pretty well-regarded prospect so i don't know that anybody is selling but again, yeah. Wyatt Langford really overshadowed him in the spring and I think kind of took some of the shine off of Evan Carter's star. So I think there's a chance that maybe the person who has him in your league isn't really fully convinced in how good he is. So I'm in control of the questions here. So last question of the day, DJ, please tell me the Julio Turan experiment <laughs> is just for the revenge game and that it is over. Well, I mean, if it was a revenge game, he didn't do very well. He didn't. Um, I, I think it's a stopgap situation and we'll see, you know, when Tyler McGill's ready, of course, but, um, because of like the roster rules coming out of spring training, the Mets sent down Jose Buto. He came up last week because of injury, but I believe the Mets have to wait until April 15th to bring him back for good. Um, I think when that time comes, you know, Buto looked good in the spring. The stuff looks better than last mm-hmm. year. I think we'll see him uh stick in the rotation but sometimes we see these teams where they like having the depth so i wouldn't i wouldn't rule out the possibility that Turan uh gets at least one more start and then they see where they are because it's pitching and we've seen how it's gone recently if they want to risk letting him go um but i think it'll be buto's spot eventually and then we'll see you know when and then then christian scott's spot let's Um, hope so yeah but i i and i listen i know this is a pessimistic take and you might not want to hear it But I also think there is some value to a team like the Mets that maybe their window opened a little bit more given the injuries in Atlanta, but they're probably not a playoff team this year given the roster they've assembled. And guys like Severino, Sean Manaya, Adrian Hauser, who are on short-term contracts who could then be dealt at the beginning of the summer to teams that are dealing with you know, starting pitcher injuries, like I think there's some value in the Mets continuing to run out these veterans for a couple more months, allowing them to build up some value and then saying, okay, we'll trade them. We'll get a low level pitching prospect back. We'll call up Christian Scott. We'll call up Mike Vassell. You know, we'll let Jose Budo stick in the rotation. And then it's a little bit of like when people wanted them to play the kids last year. And I think you'll see the kids in the rotation maybe from like july on i would um, take that and, and with the severino thing especially when the mets sign him I, I a lot of people are like hmm they signed severino but i think the plan is yes 
he bounces back, but then the Mets pay the remainder of his contract. They cover all of it and they can do kind of what they did last year. Maybe not to the degree of getting these top prospects, but a pretty good prospect out of the deal by paying the salary. I think that's what their plan is. Yeah, and I was just looking right now. It's like Sean Manaya signed a two-year contract, but there's an opt-out, um, and I'm looking. It is a pl- okay. It's a player option. Oh, okay. So Sean Manaya could opt into the He's deal next so year, which is for nice. thirteen point really five million. But again, if Sean Manaya is looking good. Like if he's pitching like he's pitching right now, thirteen point five million next year for him is not a crazy salary, and there are teams that will be willing to trade for Sean Manaya and pay him thirteen million dollars next year if he continues to look, you know, anything close to this version of him. Um, so I could see I could see the Mets kind of like sticking with these guys for a while. All right, I think that'll do it for this week. Oh, do you something you want Just, to Just we we should update because I hinted at this before, but in case people didn't see the update on Nick Pavetta, um, Craig Breslow, the Red Sox director of baseball operations, said it's a mild flexor strain and they expect him to spend the minimum amount of time on the IL. They decided to make the move now because the way the schedule sets up with off days. They figured that they could put him on the IL and not have him miss a start or have him miss one start at the most and allow the other pieces to fill in. Again, it, it's an arm injury for a pitcher, and so our alarm bells go off, and we don't know how long he is going to be out for. But as of right now, and as of what the Red Sox have just said publicly, this doesn't appear to be like a Framber Valdez, Spencer Strider like you know type of worry. So don't don't cut Pavetta. Put him on your IL. See how this plays off, plays out. If somebody did cut him because they were just like in tears with all these pitcher injuries and just didn't want to deal with it anymore, he's a guy you could stash on your IL and see how this all plays out. Kyle Bradish ready to go on a rehab assignment just came across as well. Wild. It's wild. Like I, I, it would be so great if that could happen because we just need some some good news. Um, I am incredibly skeptical it's going to work out for the whole season. I, but, yeah, I, I could be one of those things where you know you start to ramp it up in a game situation, and and who knows? Right. I don't want to be the pessimist, but like that's sometimes how these things go. So we'll see. But we're we're hoping for the best uh, for Kyle Bradish. Had a great year last year. Um, really exciting time for the Orioles. We highlighted that a couple of times today. So hopefully he comes back healthy. Um, all right, so that'll do it for this week. We'll be back next Tuesday. At 1 p.m. Eastern for our usual fantasy baseball QA. In the meantime, stay tuned to the Roto World Baseball Show. Comes out twice a week. Eric and uh, Scott Pianowski from Yahoo uh, host that show. And also go to NBCSports.com, go to our fantasy baseball section, check out everything we have to offer there. Thanks so much, everyone. See you next time. <laughs>